Jamil, I've been at Equifax for the past five years and I've had a front row seat to the security and digital transformation that has happened. And it's been incredible to watch the work that has happened behind the scenes. What do you feel about the past five years as we get you know, ready to release our fifth security annual report? The first thing is our progress. It's been incredible, you know, led in large part by the work of you and your team. Um, the next one is, is we've pushed the envelope in so many areas. It's, it's, I'm really proud of how much we've driven, not just the security posture here, but the industry at large. Uh, and then the, the final one is around transparency. The, the fact that we've been bold enough to be as transparent as we have been with the, with the uh, industry at large, with our other stakeholders, with the government and so forth, by, by putting our best foot forward and telling folks what we've been doing year after year with all of the, the detailed measures that we have, our strategic vision, the threats that, we, that are out there and that we're, we're, we're planning to try to tackle. Um, I think it's a, it's a testament to the culture of this organization um, that we fundamentally want to be a leader and that we're not just talking about it, but we're actually showing it through the actions that we put in place. Absolutely. And it's also a testament to the, to the amazing people we have that we work alongside on a daily basis. Jamila, um, switching gears a little bit, um, when it comes to supply chain attacks, we have read reports about you know, the increasing complexity. We, in fact, we've seen uh, you know, the, the nature of the attack change with AI and with you know a bunch of other uh, techniques that are coming into play, how are we staying ahead? Um, you know of these kinds of attacks. How are we protecting our data at Equifax? There was a uh, another laundry list of organizations that were compromised uh, via supply chain attacks in in 2024, and I expect the same thing probably to occur uh, sadly in, in 2025. We we've we have really pushed in this area. Now, first off, we do all of the standard things, as you as you well know, um, in terms of assessments and the stuff like that. Um, but I think we we've taken an approach where, at least in my worldview, there, there's a handful of things that matter most here. Making sure that you know where your data is at and who who has it and how it's being transmitted, um, and then it's around the access controls. Like what what are what are the what are the mechanisms you have in place to allow or disallow third parties from being able to access uh, your environment, your assets and stuff like that. And so I think we've done a really good job of having a comprehensive and thoughtful view around what what those two things look like. And then um, ensure we're locking them down and we're making good risk based decisions in that space. I think the thing that really helped us push the envelope in this space was the the cloud control initiative that we launched um, a couple of years ago. And in this in, in this area, this is another one that really that really was um, novel. We worked with our third party uh, partner that now allows all of our customers to be able to see their security posture on the for the uh, products and services that we provide to them in a real time basis. The exact same data sets that I myself can see as the as the you know head of security here. Um, they can see for, for their environments as well, which is a completely novel, really unique, very powerful data set that anyone can use to be able to make better risk-based security decisions. Um, and so when I, when I think about the evolution of, of this space, I think we need more things like that so we can get out of this paper pushing um, uh, paradigm that I think we've been in for, for so long within third-party security. And, and the threat's not going away. It's it just, it, it, there's a monumental focus on this by our attackers. And the reason they focus on it is because it's quite frankly, not that difficult to be able to use that vector. And so I think we all need to step it up. And I, I'd love to see more organizations really lean in and try to innovate in this space so that we can all be better protected. Absolutely. And I think, um, you, you know, things like zero trust and, you know, segmentation and, and you know, foundational stuff that, that we were looking at, you know, least privilege or segregation of duties, all of that just becomes so much more important in this new uh, paradigm that, that we just have to get better at foundational security at, at, at the same time innovate in order to be able to stay ahead of these kind of attacks. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to have the foundational stuff. That's, that's table stakes. I think the, the challenge that we see in security today, oftentimes, it's not 
some new tool or new this or new that. Oftentimes the, the, the weakest link, like the gap in cybersecurity is, it's an operational one in many respects. And, and when you talk about operations, we're talking about foundational controls. And it's not just putting those controls in place or getting full coverage across the environment. It's about doing those things day in and day out, just grinding it out. And I think that's when I look at the last five years at Equifax, I think the thing I'm most proud of isn't all of the novel stuff and pushing boundaries and things like that. It's that the team has embraced that culture and that notion yes. and that we all lean in and we just grind like day in and day out. Um, and, and I think that's what's put us, elevated us to the point that we are, are today. It is. And, and Jamil, just thinking ahead um, with AI being the center of pretty much every security conversation. <laughs> Uh, with of reports, every conversation, not every just conversation. security. Yeah. Exactly. What do you feel um, or where do you think security is headed in the next five years? You know, since 22, I think it is, it's been, it's just exploded. Um, and quite frankly, I'm really optimistic about the opportunities that we have, both in the technology as, as well as the security side. And you and your team are doing all kinds of really cool experiments on this front that I, I cannot wait cannot wait to uh, to see the results of. I mean, of being able to leverage AI to be able to monitor data flow diagrams and, and yes. reduce a lot of the paperwork that we have. And anyway, there's a ton of stuff there. On the risk side of AI, um, it's super scary. It's I think it's really scary. So you've got voice cloning as a major threat now. Deep fakes are exploding. I think the the year over year numbers on that alone are it's they're up like 480 or 90 percent low base. I get it, but um, I, I don't see that rate of increase slowing down. It's it's going to it's going to continue to 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 move in that direction. Um, and then you've got the you know the old school phishing, social engineering kind of attacks that are just massively amplified by the power of AI. And um, you know. It, Back in the day, you'd have to do some research on somebody, come up, craft up a message. It doesn't seem like some Nigerian scam or something that someone's actually going to open. Nowadays, you can just open up AI and do it at scale across yes. an entire organization that's going to be really well tailored to each one of those individuals. And so it becomes very difficult to be able to train a workforce to be able to defend against that stuff. So the the, the threats, I think, are, are, are truly exploding right now. And we've all got to got to up our game to be able to defend against it. I think I do think there's an argument for this AI versus AI thing um, in terms of AI fights fighting AI. Um, but I think we need to bring other tools to the table. And, and I think our our marquee uh, accomplishment in in 2024 was the one you led around passwordless, which actually fits perfectly into this in, into being able to help mitigate a lot of these threats. Um, in a in a in a complete in a complete way um, versus the AI versus AI approach. So, I mean, on that note, I would love to hear your thoughts on passwordless, what we've done, the the value proposition. Just help help other people understand wh what what it is that you did and 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 the upside and benefits and sort of the, the response that you've received as a result. If you remember, Jamil, back in 2023 when we started our passwordless journey. Um, we were just focused on web applications and just switching over a few applications to, you know, passwordless authentication. Um, and then, you know, there were several breaches that happened in the industry uh, that caught our attention and completely changed the way we were looking at passwordless. We understood quickly that we had to look at every possible authentication channel, uh, including, uh, you know, caller authentication, where users call in um, to to authenticate it with help desk um, using security questions and um, you know, non-human accounts that mimic human behavior like bot accounts or AI agents um, or even uh, synthetic monitors. So we had to look across all of these channels in order to truly reduce risk. And so you know, we began last year by cutting over our entire global workforce uh, to passwordless across all user authentication channels. And then this year, our focus is going to be the non-human accounts uh, and to try and switch over all of our channels over to passwordless by the end of 2025. That'll be great. And um, we also had a, a 
large number of CISOs reach out to us with interest as well, trying to follow in the path that we were in, which is um, super encouraging because I think the, the, the more passwords throughout the industry that we can eliminate, the more safe and secure we will all be. Of course. And, and Jameel, what was interesting about the conversations that we had, you know, with these other security teams, um, surprisingly, they were all thinking about passwordless similar to us in 2023 um, in, you know, in certain subsections of their population without thinking about the, you know, the entirety of it. Um, and so I think that was one common theme where we had to, you know, give them that, that, angle where you're not totally reducing the risk if you're just looking at user authentication. There are all these other channels that exist uh, that also have an equal risk to the organization. Uh, and the other interesting bit that kept coming up was when do we do passwordless? Um, because a lot of people tend to believe that passwordless is like a cherry on top, meaning you do everything foundational, you do a lot of these traditional security um, enforcement mechanisms. And then when everything is good, to go, you then do passwordless. But we, at least I think, came to the opinion that the risk with passwords are so high that passwordless is what you begin with. At whatever point you are within your security journey, you should be focused on passwordless so that you can immediately bring down the risk and then continue to focus on the other foundational aspects. Yeah, if it was a technology that was mature enough um, back in the day, it would be the you know, first or second, tops, third control that I would implement wherever I would, wherever I went. It's been that big of a win for us. And Jamil, I read in a recent LinkedIn post of yours um, where you were talking about enablement. And you were saying that true enablement is not about survival. That just doing, you know, uh, risk reduction or meeting audit compliance, that was not good enough for enablement. Can you tell us a little more about that? I think survival is the floor, but the 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 ceiling is is enablement, and and the difference between those two things, fundamentally, is leadership, and how you choose to approach the job, how you choose to approach managing risk, and I think nowadays how you choose to approach the implementation of your controls. Are you just focused on buying down risk, or are you con conscious of the impacts that your controls um, place on the workforce at large. Um, we talked about passwordless a little while ago. The, the, the beauty of passwordless is that it does both. It addresses the risks that we face. It eliminates those, that, that entire factor. But at the same time, it makes life a lot easier for every single user that, that interacts with it. It does. No more, no more resetting your password, no more mistypes, no more, you know, across the board. We need more controls like this. We need a, a worldview that's accepted throughout our industry that's not just purely buying down risk and, and, uh, and crushing folks with controls. We need more thoughtfulness in this space. And so when I talk about survival doesn't equal enablement, yes, am I talking specifically about control implementations and how we can operate on a day-to-day basis, sure. But I think more than that, I'm trying to talk about a, a, a philosophical approach to running cybersecurity in a way that allows us to be able to have a seat at the table, to truly be business leaders and not just protect everything, but help our businesses grow. Makes sense. And Jamil, you've been a year into your role as the CTO. What are your impressions um, about the role itself? And has there been anything that surprised you, um, you know, in the past year? What hasn't surprised me in the past year? Um, it's been a lot. It's been a, it's been a, um, it's been a great journey, I think. Um, and I think the, the most impressive part about it has been watching the teams, security and technology work so closely together um, toward a common end. And a lot of the things throughout my career that I thought were virtually impossible, that you hear all of these excuses about, oh, we can't achieve these patch rates, we can't achieve this compliance coverage, you can't you know, have all of these standardized pipelines. You know, you got, all of those things went by the wayside, all of them. 
Um, and it's because we took a different approach. We wanted to have a unified team and, and re reduce the level of tension that we always have between those two functions so that we can operate as one. Without security, there is no trust. And without trust, you're not gonna have any customers. Car manufacturers don't develop the latest fancy cars without a seatbelt. And the reason is because you need to focus on the protection and safety of your customer base. Um, we're doing the same thing here. Like we have never compromised on, on our security program. We're not gonna release a product or a service unless it has the appropriate privacy and, and, and security controls um, top to bottom. And what I've learned over the course of the past year is that those two things, those two programs, technology and security, those two areas, security and innovation, they actually work very, very well together. And, um, and I think that I, I wish that more organizations would see the, the symbiotic nature between those two functions because um, you can do a lot of great things. You can execute a lot faster. Um, you can get to, get to growth or time to live uh, far quicker and far better um, than you can otherwise. I completely agree, Jamil. And at least from my perspective, um, I think the biggest difference that we are seeing is just the collaboration between the two teams uh, and the benefit it has for both teams, meaning our ability to think from the other side has truly changed the way we think about both security and enablement. Uh, Jamil, thank you so much for your time. And for everyone watching, please don't stop here. Do take a few minutes to read through our security report, come back to us with questions, concerns, and even maybe ideas on how we can improve further. Um, on our side, as Jamil mentioned, we want to try to continue doubling down on our security with a continued focus on uh, transparency, collaboration, and sharing. Thank you.